Next up, uh, I'm glad to introduce Dr. Anthony Hunleth. Uh, so he is currently the Joint Clinical Chair of the South East London Cancer Alliance. He has been a GP for 13 years and has started working for the Macmillan Cancer Support in 2012 as a GP facilitator. He will be talking to us about managing the gastrointestinal problems as a result of pelvic radiation disease, providing a primary care perspective. Welcome, Anthony. I don't think we can hear you. If you could just unmute yourself. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, no worries thank, you thank you for having me here today. I'm definitely not an expert in uh, pelvic radiation disease, but the lucky thing is, as a primary care physician, we don't have to be experts. And really, if there was, you know, if I was going to get any messages across today for primary care physicians, um, doctors and nurses, it's just uh, the really important thing is to be aware um, of, of the problems people can be can face after pelvic radiation and have it clearly apparent in our IT system. So get our coding right so that when people present with symptoms, or at least considering in the background whether it could be related to previous cancer treatment. And that's the case for primary care and, and most consequences of treatment, to be honest. So if you could bring the slides up now, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, so we've already had an introduction, so we can move on to the next slide, please. So cancer and primary care. So uh, more and more people being diagnosed with cancer, but obviously, great news, you know, lots more people surviving for a long time after, after a cancer diagnosis. So what it means for us in primary care is that we have many more people on our primary care lists, on our patient lists, that have had a cancer diagnosis in the past that have received treatment for cancer. And that will, you know, over half of them now will be living over 10 years after a diagnosis. Yet, you know, over a quarter of these will be experiencing consequences of the cancer treatment that has a significant impact on their quality of life. And many of us as GPs may lack awareness of the short and the acute the consequences of cancer, but of cancer treatment, but specifically the more the longer term effects of cancer treatment, and certainly understanding how how we can manage them and the the, uh, the measures we can go to in primary care to manage them, whilst also really importantly knowing our limitations, especially when it comes to gastrointestinal effects. If you can move on to the next slide, please. So, um, really difficult to establish the numbers that we might have in our primary care lists of people with pelvic radiation disease and specifically gastrointestinal problems due to pelvic radiation disease. And this is probably, you know, in many ways because we don't ask in primary care necessarily um, when we don't ask patients who previously had pelvic radiation whether they're suffering from any of these problems. And unfortunately, a lot of people may not present to us because they don't feel that we have the, the skills potentially or the knowledge to help them. It's likely more common than in primary care than um, conditions, inflammatory viral conditions like Crohn's disease, yet all GPs will be aware of Crohn's disease and have a certain understanding in, in how to manage it, but it, it's not the case for gastrointestinal problems from pelvic radiation disease. And it really should be clear to us in primary care who's at risk. You know, we have robust IT systems in primary care and we should be coding everybody that has a cancer diagnosis, there should be a clear code that never goes away. And also we should be coding people who've had radiotherapy. So, when we look at our screens, our problem lists, it should be really clear that somebody's had um, a cancer that affected the pelvis and that they've had radiation. And so, you know, it, it, it should be on the top of our minds really that they could be at risk of, of not only gastrointestinal effects, but the multiple effects of pelvic radiation disease. Um, of course, there is a problem that there's a significant symptom overlap with multiple other conditions and multiple very common conditions that we will see in primary care. There's a few listed there, so celiac disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, but also irritable bowel syndrome, um, infectious diverticular disease, um, and a lot of these we will see very commonly in primary care. So it's really easy for us to think of the common things first and not necessarily potentially relate things back to previous treatments. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the, some of the challenges we face as primary care physicians? Um, communication isn't always great between secondary and primary care and primary and secondary care, of course. And we don't, there is a lack of us getting, receiving treatment in some ways in primary care. And that can be a really key tool, as simple as it is, that we can then flag on the system that somebody is at risk. You know, we can flag in the summary what symptoms they may be at risk of developing and we can flag that in our IT systems. 
just to increase the chances of it, of it getting noticed. Um, GPs may lack the knowledge uh, regarding the treatments received and the consequences, the potential consequences of the treatments some may have received. Um, and a lot of us as GPs have a lack of knowledge in identifying and managing these consequences of cancer treatment. Partly because obviously it's not a specialist area, but often we won't see it very frequently and therefore uh, we might not be up to date in, into how to manage it. Um, we don't always link late effects back to a previous cancer. Um, and patients, as was already said, patients may feel that they don't, they can't present to primary care with these problems because then they don't have confidence that they will, will understand how to potentially manage them. Along with that, obviously, many people who have these problems have multiple comorbidities and polypharmacy, which can also contribute to the symptoms. Next slide, please. Um, Primary care physicians, obviously, as, as GPs and, and uh, general practice nurses, we need to be conscious of the multiple cancers that uh, may have uh, somebody may have had that, uh, that has caused them to receive uh, pelvic radiotherapy, um, and um, also the myriad of other non-GI potential short and long-term side effects. We need to manage people holistically, obviously, um, and so we need to be aware of the multiple um, potential consequences of symptoms. But fortunately, we don't have to be experts in any of them, as I've already said. Next slide, please. So managing uh, gastrointestinal symptoms in primary care from pelvic radiation. Um, so obviously it's important for the GP to think how long after the treatment is this presenting, because that will you know, significantly affect our decision as to what we might want to do about this. And certainly if somebody is undergoing acute treatment, we should be liaising and uh, with the specialist immediately and, and, and asking them to manage acute problems. Um, Really, understand, really important for us in primary care to understand that we don't have to be experts and therefore we, we need to understand our limitations. So we, if we have an understanding of what we can potentially help with in primary care, the levels that we can go to before we have to reach out and before it's really important to reach out for our uh, colleagues to get involved. Um, we need to be aware of oncological emergencies, um, of surgical emergencies like obstruction and perforation and hemorrhage and infection and when in the journey these might be when in the journey after a cancer and after the treatment of the cancer these might be more likely to present and of course any of these are happening we have to respond immediately um, and also we always have to consider recurrent disease um, so in people and this is even more important now we are managing people with stratified follow-up um, a lot of people won't be necessarily after an Certainly with uh, colorectal cancer, say, and, and prostate cancer now, these people won't be necessarily going up to secondary care to have regular reviews. So it's even more important that if people are on stratified follow up, that as GPs, we we're, we're have a process in which we can identify that people might have these problems, we're confident enough to ask and, and manage what we can, but also aware of the potential symptoms of the emergencies and the current. Next slide, please. So, I mean, Obviously, I'm not an expert, and experts have been speaking all day. Um, but I just put a list up of the of some of the gastrointestinal syndromes that uh, people may present to primary care with secondary pelvic treatment. Um, and I guess one important thing to say is all these symptoms can present in primary care due to other causes as well. Um, so you know, I know I keep saying it's really about awareness, but it's really important that when um, a patient presents, the, the, the GP is just aware that they have had previous radiotherapy, so that they consider it, and consider it in potentially a, a list of potential causes for the symptoms that the patient is presenting with. Next slide, please. So, um, I guess maybe one of the uh, important things we can do in primary care is just to do a really basic assessment. We heard about you know, some basic assessments for the other symptoms previously, and it's really, it, it, this could be just a really simple tool that anybody can do in primary care that can really guide us in whether we can manage these symptoms or whether we need to be reaching out for help. Um, and we know that these, there are these four trigger questions that we can ask. So are people having to get up during the night to open their bowels? Um, do they have significant urgency? Um, do they suffer from fetal leakage or incontinence? And also, really importantly, do they have symptoms that are preventing them from enjoying their life? Um, I've said I'm not an expert in this, and I'm not, but it's really close to my heart. My mum had um, colorectal cancer and had surgery and significant radiotherapy to her pelvis, and her cancer was cured. But for the next 10 years of her life, um, her life was ruined because of the, the effects of the surgery and the radiation to her pelvis. So I think we, 
as primary care, we need to be aware when people are having really trying to manage these symptoms themselves and it's significantly impacting on the quality of, quality of life. You know, they're not leaving the house. They're not able to, able to do things they normally enjoy, like go out for a meal or go to the theatre or the cinema. And these are all things that my mum lost that she used to uh, really enjoy before, before she had the cancer. Next slide, please. So primary care management. Um, I'm not really sure about the audience, so I don't want to linger too much, but um, you know, there are some simple things we can do, simple first steps that we can do in primary care. And one of them is asking people to keep a bowel diary and a diet diary to try and identify triggers. And remembering that there may be some common triggers, but for each individual, the triggers may be unique. And the only way to identify that is by keeping a bowel and a diet diary. We can give some dietary advice. And that may um, segue a little bit from the dietary advice we might normally give. So, um, you know, is somebody actually having too much fiber in an attempt to manage their symptoms? Um, advising people to advise, advise, avoid high fat or caffeine or alcohol, food and drinks. And definitely advice ad avoiding skipping meals, even though it might be tempting for people to skip meals, especially if they're wanting to go out for the day. Dietitian input can be really helpful and perhaps imperative for a lot of patients, but it might be that we need specialist diet dietitian input, and it might be that the dietitian we normally have in our practices uh, doesn't have the expertise. Um, but it, of course, it's a, it's a reasonable first step. Um, perhaps prescribing some stool bulking agents for people that, who's Prominent symptoms may be constipation or tenesmus. But again, simple practical advice, um, advising people about just in case cards and radar keys um, and making sure that they know where to access those. Next slide, please. So if, if somebody's main symptom is diarrhea, obviously we can do some simple things in primary care, like send a stool sample, check for C. diff, um, consider pancreatic insufficiency, and if we think that that might be a problem, they may have to go in for specialist tests. Um, as we've already talked about the dietitian and uh, for, uh, for other symptoms, but certainly for diarrhea, it's really important as well. We might consider a low dose uh, tricyclic antidepressant. And you know, for some people, biothot binders like colocevalam might be important, but we are aware that there are slightly odd prescribing restrictions on medications like that uh, that can vary from borough to borough. Next slide, please. Pain on defecation, um, be sure to examine in primary care, check for fissures and piles. We may be able to manage some simple problems in primary care. If we notice some ulceration, we must always refer in, but perhaps get advice initially to see if there's something we can do in the short term whilst the way to see the specialist like prescribing antibiotics. Um, steroidal anti-inflammatory medi medication locally might be uh, something we can help with. Um, and if we have access to something like acupuncture, um, some people may benefit from this or prescribing neuropathic agents or antidepressant medications potentially. Next slide, please. Um, so the considerations for primary care, um, obviously, the, you know, we've heard about the effects today. And for, as a primary care physician, we must consider all these potential effects. We must see the patient holistically and think what other organs may have been affected by this radiotherapy and what, so what other questions do we need to ask? So asking about urinary symptoms, sexual problems, fertility concerns, body image issues, fatigue, um, skin problems potentially. Um, and very, very importantly, I know you've had a talk about it earlier, but psychological issues. Um, it's not only the direct impact of the diagnosis and the treatment, but how significantly it's affecting somebody's quality of life, how um, significantly it's affecting somebody's ability to enjoy their life. The next slide, please. I think I'm almost finished now. So here are just some of the resources we have at Macmillan Cancer Support. Um, and if as a primary care physician, all we do is signpost people to useful information, perhaps that's all we need to do. Um, and on the Consequences of Treatment website that Macmillan created with the Royal College of General Practitioners, um, there's access to a lot of our useful resources on there, as well as some one pages um, for GPs on some of the really common effects of, 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 of common concepts of treatment, but certainly some of the common pelvic effects of pelvic radiation, uh, not just gastrointestinal effects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, obviously, everybody on the, on the uh, conference probably knows about radar keys, but as primary care physicians, we don't know about them necessarily. And this might be the one thing that we can do for a patient that can you know, have an impact on their quality of life, whilst potentially we'll try to find other treatments or waiting for specialist input. 
Next slide, please. So this is just a slide of the consequence of Absolute Toolkit. Um, it's really, really helpful for any professionals. There's, there's uh, lots of detail on there, but there are, as I say, one page is for primary care physicians that can be really useful just to have access to, and they just distill it down to what we might need to do to manage that consequence of primary care. And again, very, very importantly, what are the limitations? When do we need to refer on? Uh, next slide, please. I think that's it, yeah. So um, hopefully I didn't go too much over time there. Um, I don't know whether there are any questions for me. Thank you very, very much for that, Anthony. Um, yes, we do actually have a question for you. Uh, whose responsibility is it to ensure that GPs are fully educated and equipped to support patients after cancer treatment? Um, so it's a really good question because, um, you know, educating primary care physicians is a real challenge. Um, you know, we're, we're a, a large profession, we're quite difficult to reach when it comes to education. And unfortunately, when through traditional ways of education, like conferences, etc., like this, we're often going to reach, uh, reach only a small number and often um, primary care physicians that are, you know, interested and keen and proactive. Um, so certainly, obviously, there are responsibilities with uh, the RCGP and NHS England, etc., and health, health Education England, but certainly as uh, charities, we do a lot of education. So uh, at Macmillan Cancer Support, we have a network of over 200 GPs around the country. And one of the main things that they do is deliver education to local GPs. You know, and one of the big things they will cover is consequences of cancer treatment, partly because obviously at Macmillan, it's one of our priorities. Um, you know, often with uh, subjects like we're talking about today for primary care, it is bite-sized learning, you know, they won't necessarily need to spend a lot of time to um, be aware of, of the simple, you know, the main symptoms and the simple things we can do in primary care. Um, and there are, uh, there's a great, uh, there's some great um, resources out there like Gateway C, which is a primary care education tool free to all GPs in England at the moment. And I know they've got some um, modules on this that GPs can access anytime. Amazing. Thank you very, very much for that. 